I'm Eddie Gomez in Sacramento. Yesterday, Governor Newsom signed a new law requiring presidential candidates disclose their tax returns in order to be on the California primary ballot. I'm at the McGeorge School of Law talking to constitutional law professor Leslie Jacobs, asking the questions a lot of you guys have on your mind. Can Governor Newsom do this? Is it constitutional? The question here is, does anything stop the California legislature from saying, well, to be eligible to be on the ballot, to maybe right, be a candidate that the electors vote for, you have to disclose your tax returns. So as I said, one part of the Constitution, federal Constitution, says states can do almost anything they want when deciding how to choose these electors. But the other part of the Constitution says what the qualifications for president are. There are only three of them, natural born citizen, age 35 or over, and have lived here for over 14 years. Three qualifications, but those qualifications are exclusive, meaning states can't add more of them. So the question then becomes, um, when, the state, when California is saying you have to disclose your tax returns, is California adding a qualification? Or is California doing what it's allowed to do which is setting the procedures for the candidate to get on the ballot. So for example, California could say you have to have so many signatures to get on a ballot. California could say you have to get those signatures in by a certain time. They could say we're only going to put you on the ballot if you have a certain level of support. Those are all just procedural neutral requirements to make it orderly, the access to the ballot. And so here, California legislature says, well, we're putting this here because we want our voters to understand this piece of information because it's important to understanding who to vote for. So the question would be, is it just a procedural requirement or is it actually such a big deal that it establishes a qualification, in which case then it would not be okay and it would conflict with the Constitution. There's no easy answer to these questions. There isn't an easy answer and people say, gosh, why haven't we figured this out before. But I have to keep reminding people, we have the shortest constitution in the world, federal constitution. The words are so few, and it's up to the courts then to take the particular circumstances and say, ah, you know, what does this mean? And they look at those words, they look at their other cases, they look at what's happened in other states. So that's what would have to go on. Wow. So what do you think will happen next? I mean, obviously this will be taken to court. Um Yes, and so uh, undoubtedly what we will see is that Republican National Committee, Trump campaign, some combination uh, will file a lawsuit. They'll file it here in California, um, probably in this district, in federal court, and what they will do is argue that the statute that the legislature passed violates the Constitution. They'll make their arguments, and what they will ask for is a um, emergency order and an emergency order from the court halting in the statute from going into effect. We call it a temporary restraining order or a preliminary injunction and so that's what they will ask for and so the first thing we'll see is we'll see a federal district court entering a ruling about whether to halt uh, the statute while the court considers whether it's constitutional or not. That is, before it makes its final judgment. Do we know how long that could take? Because as we know, 2020 is right around the corner. Uh, so what does this mean for the election next year? Well, it's up to the court to decide how quickly to hear the case. A temporary restraining order, the court would hear quite quickly. Now again, you have to have a big, huge emergency um, that's going to happen in a couple weeks, and I don't see that going on here. So most likely what we would do is we'd see a motion that would take several months um, for the parties to prepare their papers and to go in and have an argument. They'd have an argument before the court, the court would take some time, and then would reach its decision. And then as we've seen with other instances like this, because we've certainly seen this type of procedure with um, Exactly, with all sorts of things going on. So then we would see an appeal to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals and potentially then an appeal even to the Supreme Court um, of this temporary type of order. It would have to go very, very fast, uh, but I would assume that the courts would do what we call expedite 
uh, the hearings because it's so important to decide this quickly. Do you think a case like this would make it to the Supreme Court? It could possibly make it to the Supreme Court depending upon what the, uh, happened below. You know, a lot of people are saying, is this even constitutional? Exactly. Well, and it's one of the classic conflicts between state and federal power as well. Now here, the federal power is the federal constitution, but we see this happen all the time. That's our structure of government. We've got this broad outline of the constitution, and then the states can do almost anything they want unless they you know, hit up against the constitution, and then there's a problem. And it's the courts who are the ones who decide that. Right. Can we talk about 2017? Because this was put up, um, this was brought up in 2017, and then of course Governor Brown at that time vetoed it. But uh, can we go back and talk a little bit about why it was vetoed, um, or a little well, bit more? Well, sure. Was the wording the same? Uh, as you know, I'm not sure about do? exactly the wording. Okay. I think it was substantially similar. Okay. And uh, when a governor is making a decision like this, the governor looks at a number of things. One thing is, is it constitutional? But another thing is, is it even questionable, in which case it will take a bunch of resources to defend it? And then the governor also looks at policy considerations, which as governor, should he do this or shouldn't he do this? Should the state take this type of position? And so certainly when Governor Brown made this decision, he looked at all three of those things, and his judgment was, slippery slope, we're just going to get into a mess here, um, allowing this sort of thing. In my judgment as governor, I don't think that this is the right policy position for California to take. Now, obviously, Governor Newsom took a while, um, but has reached a different decision, again, uh, weighing the same considerations. The considerations haven't really changed. Uh, but again, like the underlying constitutional question, you can go both ways in deciding as a policy matter, should this be law or shouldn't it? Does the federal constitution forbid what California has done? And we don't have a clear answer to that. The best I can do is say that the question is whether California is adding a new qualification to being on the ballot, in which case it's unconstitutional. Or is California establishing a procedural requirement for being on the ballot in which case it would be constitutional.